Welcome to this week's edition of the Mike Bray Show. I'm your host, Tony Simeone, joined by the head basketball coach, Mike Bray. Coach, this week you went one and one. You had a great win at home, 34 points. Then you lose a tough one down there on the road at Tallahassee. As a coach, just what's your takeaway from a week like this? Well, I love our team, and I love the position that we've earned to date. Um, no question, we played great and together, and it was a fun atmosphere against Georgia Tech. And then we ran into a bit of a buzzsaw in Tallahassee. We've not had much luck in Tallahassee. They really shot it well. We fought, gave ourselves a chance, but I think you got to tip your cap to Florida State. They made more big plays than us. One thing you did lock up with the victory against Georgia Tech was a top three seed in the ACC tournament. Gives you a double bye, a real advantage going into Brooklyn. How important was that for your team to take care of that before the end of the season? I think that's something to be really proud of. I think that is our fourth double bye that we've locked in nine years in this league. And, and it gives you a chance to win it. There's no question. I don't know if you can, people have won four and then some have even won five in a row. But man, you, you, you gotta be, I think, playing on Thursday to get to Saturday. And we know we're gonna be in the evening session. We'd like to earn the two seed. Coach, appreciate it. When we come back, we'll break down both the games versus Georgia Tech and Florida State. This is the Mike Bray Show presented by TireRack.com. It's now time for this week's game breakdown as we go inside both of Notre Dame's games from this week. Coach, let's start with Georgia Tech. I'm obviously a great win, 34 points, but let's start before the game. Coming into this one, you actually knew it was the last game with your student section in the crowd. How important was it to get out to a good start in this game for you guys? Well, I wanted us to deliver for our student section because they have been fabulous. Then they go on spring break. We know we're going to lose them for the Pittsburgh game, but we got out of the gate early, and we got out of the gate early keeping it to one and done and running. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things I think that helps us is getting down the floor fast. We're such a good passing team and we were able to do that early. One of the guys that took advantage of that transition was Dane Goodwin. Has been in single figures a few more times recently, but 17 points, they all came in the first half. What did you see from him in the first half that you liked and what's the Dane Goodwin that you saw that you hope will keep it going here in March? I think the transition opportunities really helped him. You know, he runs the floor, he gets down the floor and he plays with guards, Blake, Cormac Prentice, who throw ahead. Mm -hmm. And we threw ahead a lot quickly, and he just attacked and made plays. And it, it's something I think we've got to keep working on and stressing, easy baskets mm -hmm. in transition when we can get them. Your team assisted on 21 of the 30 field goals. I know that's a huge number for you, specifically Prentice Hub again. I think over the course of his last three games is over seven assists per game. When the ball is moving like that, how dynamic can this team be offensively? You know, it's one of the things that maybe is most gratifying to me as their coach when that ball moves and they share it like that. And there is a great trust. And I think we know we've learned when we share it like that, we got a great chance of winning, and we've got to continue to do that through the month of March. Blake Wesley also had a great first half for you, 15 points. What stood out to me was his ability to get to the rim, and we've talked about it the last couple of weeks. When he's maybe settling for less threes and putting his head down, going to the rim, that seems to unlock even more of his offensive potential. Is that what you saw from him in the first half? I did, and I think that's where he's grown mm -hmm. as a basketball player, you know, since January maybe settling for threes a little too much. Now, after some movement, driving the ball, getting fouled, driving the ball, finding people. I I'm really proud of how his game has matured as a young guy. It was 46-27 at halftime, so you've got this 19-point lead, but it's a conference game. You know Georgia Tech is probably going to come out and try to hit you in the mouth. You didn't let them do that. So what was the discussion like at halftime? How was your team able to keep the pedal to the gas? You know, we talked about getting off to a great start in the second half like we did in the first half and, and really kind of leave no mystery and not give them any hope of coming back. We've been in a lot of games where we've been up and a team makes a run and it gets to game situations, and we just thoroughly did it and I think we did it with our defense our defense and our defensive positioning was excellent uh, and then we were really moving the ball and getting open looks. One guy that stood out to me who whenever he performs and gets you some points I just feel like you guys are going to win and that's Trey Wirtz. He had three threes in this game. I just feel like when he's playing well it adds another layer to this offensive attack. What'd you like from Trey and his performance off the bench in this one? I agree with you Tony and I think he's playing really well right now for us. He's kind of found a rhythm, found a niche 
but his ability to pass, you look at his assist to turnover, he's got a great feel for the game. He is a shot maker and, and he is a good shooter and he's really made strides defensively and defensive rebounding. He very much is a key for us in this month. The other guy who I wanted to hit on who's really kind of found his role is Cormac Ryan. In this game, he actually had a career high 10 rebounds. We've talked about him all year. He's found his offense now, last five games, over 12 points per game. It just seems like he's figured out his role and now he really can find the way to best contribute to this team. I would agree with that. I think, you know, he's always defended and rebounded for us and done the dirty work on that end of the floor. I think he was still tr searching for a tempo on offense. We thought he played a little fast and a little hurried. And he's really kind of let the game come to him. He's digesting it. We know he's a great shooter. He's not turning down shots. Starting in the midst of the Lashevsky injury probably helped calm him down a little bit. But right now, you know, we need him to continue to play the way he's playing. Something that was really fun to watch, I thought, in this game was the fact that you got some guys on the floor that haven't seen a lot of big minutes this year. Let's start first with J.R. Konezny. He's a freshman that I think a lot of people are excited about because he's from the area. Hasn't seen a lot of crunch time minutes, but he got on the floor, had a dunk. What excites you about J.R.'s future? I, I'm, it's Tim Abramitis all over again. This long-term plan of getting older. He's gained 18 pounds since he's been here, and he can eat, get more, so the strength is coming. But what our people saw, they haven't got to see him much. You know, he has got great lift and bounce around the basket. He's a fearless competitor. He is going to be a key guy for us right away next season. He just needs that year to get older and stronger, and he's doing it. You know, Zona and Tony Sanders Jr. got on the floor as well. I talked to Matt Zona earlier this year. He really embraced his role as doing whatever he had to do. He's played some big minutes actually here and there coming off the bench to get those guys some run. Uh, what did it mean to you as a head coach? Yeah, and again, for Matt and Tony, this is year two where may they have not been a big part of it yet their attitudes and their work ethic when they come in and they're in blue shirts and going after the white shirts is really been a key. Uh, I, I've told them many times how proud I am. That's their role. Mm -hmm. um, now, they want a role that's gonna be bigger next year and those are all things we gotta talk about, but the attitude of that group that plays against the top seven every day has been fabulous. Let me ask you about one more guy. I left him out intentionally because Elijah Morgan had six points, two assists, two rebounds. When I see him in practice, I love watching him play. He has such a great energy to see him get that opportunity on the floor. I know he played some minutes for you last year as well. He's a guy that I think just really deserved that moment there on the home floor. Well, Elijah Morgan is a Division I guard. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't even know he was coming, and we saw him in an open tryout, and he was recruited by mid-majors. He is a really good player, and he and Prentice Hub have banged heads for a number of years. <laughs> I, I, he just adds so much to practice, but also to our fabric of our team, mm -hmm. talking to Hub, talking to Cormac Ryan, telling Trey Wirtz to keep his head up. Mm -hmm. He's really become kind of a leader for us, and a very, very important part of our team. 90 to 56 was the final. In fact, that's the biggest margin of victory you guys have had since joining the ACC when playing a conference opponent. So to win a game like that, what did that say about the mental makeup of this team? Yeah, I, I think, you know, we had it going on both ends. And and, uh, and and I also know we wanted to deliver for our fans. I, I've mentioned our students and they've been great. But our season ticket holders have been awesome too. We had a sellout. I think we've been really fun to watch. We give, we've give we given them some exciting nights in the building and we've got one more. Coach, appreciate it. We'll step aside and come back with more on this week's edition of on the Mike Bray Show presented by TireAct.com. It's time to continue our game breakdown as we look at the Florida State game from this week. Coach, going down to Tallahassee, it's a place you hadn't won yet. You knew it was going to be a difficult game because they have a ton of talent, a lot of length on that Florida State roster. Even though they weren't playing well, it seemed like you knew this was going to be a tough game going in. Yeah, that's been a tough place for us, and I tried to challenge our guys, you know, forget about standings or double by or bracketology. How about we try and get a win in Tallahassee? We haven't done it, and certainly the seniors haven't done it. And we ran into a little bit of a buzzsaw. You know, they came out and shot the heck out of the ball. I don't know if we fully expected them to make shots like that, but yet we hung in and battled. But as you said, Tony, I think at the end of the day, their length and our inability at key times to get the first miss 
kind of cost us. They were also dangerous because they're kind of playing with nothing to lose now as the yeah. season's gotten away from them. They came out and hit those first five threes. They were five for their first five from three. I think in the first media timeout, they already had maybe 17 points four minutes into the game. So when that's going on, what do you tell your team to try to keep them focused on the task at hand? You know, I, I love our poise of this group. There were two things in the game that stuck out to me as far as, you know, me trusting them. Mm -hmm. Um, we get the ball with 18 seconds to end the first half, and the ref says, you want to use your timeout, set something, you know. No, we're going to just go play, and Trey makes a great pass to Nate for a three. And then we go down five in the second half, and the place is going off, and the same ref runs by me and says, yeah, you, you want a timeout? I said, no, no, we'll figure this out. And we come right back. And I, a lot of trust with this group because they are poised, and they are pretty mentally tough and pretty battle-tested. And we hung in there and kept swinging in a tough atmosphere. Florida State, to their credit, made a few more plays. Let me follow up on then that note you made about Trey Wirtz. He was one of the guys I was gonna ask you about. We talked about his great performance against Georgia Tech. Maybe the, the stats weren't there, but I thought he gave you an amazing three minutes at the end of the first half. He hit a three, created some great looks for Nate Leshesky and your team. Uh, it just seems like he's coming on here. Trey Wirtz is playing really well for us. And you know, you wanna start your seniors on senior day. I wish I could start six guys, you know, because he should be in there too. Um, but. His, he's always had a great feel for the game. Look at his assist to turnover. He is a shot maker when it's a good shot. Where I think he's really grown is defensively and being physical in the paint and getting some defensive rebounds, and we need him this month. One of the guys he set up, I just mentioned, Nate Leshesky, had three threes in the first half. He was in the starting lineup earlier this year, and he seems to have really accepted this role coming off the bench since Cormac's been inserted to the starting lineup. What does that say about his mental makeup that he hasn't sold? He's just come out, and he's really delivered from you in big ways off the bench. You know, I, I utmost respect for Nate. He's always been a team guy. And I think he was smart enough and looked and said, and, and it's not anything I even sat down and talked to him about when he got healthy and was back. He's watching us and going, all right, Cormac, his roommate, is playing really well. We're in a good rhythm. I'll get in this role. I'll watch the game a little bit. I'm still going to play starters minutes, mm -hmm. and I'm going to come off. And, you know, that, that again, that's a team guy. That's a guy who gets it. That's a guy who wants to win, and and I have the utmost respect for, for him. Your leading scorer at halftime was Blake Wesley. He had 11 points, only took one three. So again, he's just putting his head down, going to the rim. What'd you like from him in the first half? And I need to get a comment on the dunk he had yeah. that, that really took a lot of people's breath away. You know, it's, uh, it's fun to watch a beautiful basketball player play the game. You know, he's a little bit of poetry in motion when he moves and slides. It's, it's amazing to watch. Again, the feel for the game being more efficient, not settling for jump shots, getting into the lane, driving the ball. The flush was a ESPN top 10 kind of thing. He made a play at half court where he went behind his back in the second half and three guys fell down from Florida State. And you know, there's, there's special talent stuff that happens every game where I go, whoa. Um, but he's been a great teammate, mm -hmm. and he has great teammates that have helped him grow. So at halftime, the score was 44-39. I thought you guys closed out the half really well. Again, a building you haven't won in. This team you know, knew that Florida State was probably going to come out, especially the way they came out in the first half. You figure another run is coming. So what was the message in the locker room to try to get ready for that? After taking that punch early with them making threes to be up and finish, I'm like, we're in great shape, fellas, but we're going to have to score 80 tonight. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to score tonight. We had 43. I believe on the board, we got to get this thing up into the 80s. We scored 90 against Georgia Tech. I don't think you can score in the 70s and escape today because I think they're going to score and we're going to do the best we can. And, you know, their defense doesn't let you run any kind of our motion where we get into a little bit of continuity. They just switch and overplay, and you basically become ball screen drive and hopefully make a good decision. We made some pretty good decisions. They blocked a couple shots with their length, but we're, we, we usually have to hit a few more of those threes in the second half to win on the road against anybody. You were 0 for 10 from three in the second half. I couldn't really believe it. When you saw that, what was your diagnosis of why that was? Was it you just weren't making good looks? Were you not getting the looks you normally do? Because 0 of 10, I can't think of a time where I've seen you guys go 0 for 10 yeah. from three and a half. I think they speed you up. 
they were coming in a different rhythm for us, you know, where you're not getting them out of ball reversal three or four times. We weren't really getting them in, we did get a couple looks in transition, but they make you play faster. And so I think maybe you, they're rushed a little bit, but I mean, they were good looks. We made the extra pass. We had eight assists at halftime. We could only get two in the second half. We get up into 15, 16, 17 assists when we make double digit threes. And we had looks, Dane had two in front of our bench where I'm going, you know, if those don't go in, I'm thinking it may not be our night. You know, sometimes you just feel the karma is not going to be with you. Paul Atkinson, I think, flew under the radar with another double-double, yeah. 17 points, 10 rebounds. He's been in double figures now 10 of the last 11 games. And again, you mentioned all the length that Florida State has. This is an opponent that I think maybe three uh, months ago, Paul might not have performed the way right. he did. But man, right. 17 and 10 against that team on the road, he really seems to have found a consistent way to deliver for you. He, he's playing great for us. And, and here, here's where he's so poised and mature. He didn't have a good early second half. They blocked a couple, he lost a couple out of bounds. We got him out of there, and when he goes back in, he just goes right back. It doesn't affect him. Uh, I, I, I am so pleased with what he's brought to the table. He's a warrior. He now knows what's coming at him physically every game in this league. I know you didn't get the result you wanted, but I thought your team late in the game, you know, Florida State, you know, got that off to that hot start offensively. I thought your team played some really good defensive possessions late that gave you a chance to get back yeah. in it. Now, you couldn't get the baskets on every possession you needed down the stretch, but you forced, I think, back-to-back -back shot clock violations. What did you like from your defense when the game started to tighten up? You were getting the stops that you needed. That's where this group has really grown, and I'm so proud. We knew we had to address our defense coming off of last season. And for us to be able to rely on that to get stops, like you said, shot clock violations, you know, we, we trust our defense to help us win games and not just outscore you. And um, I, I am really thrilled we've grown that way. One thing that stood out, there were two stops towards the end where you just couldn't get that rebound. I think you guys have rebounded the ball really well this year considering the size discrepancy in the league. Those plays, how do you assess them as a coach? I mean, is it just some bad luck where the ball bounces and goes off the wrong guy? There were two rebounds at the end that really could have changed this game. Yeah, I, I think it's one of those where I said when I walked in the locker room, we're flushing this. Mm -hmm. We gave ourselves a chance. We got to squeeze those, and we have. We've been better at rebounding the first miss, especially in the last four minutes in a close game. But the other night, I think sometimes you work so hard defensively, and you're so frenzied that when you get to it, you've guarded for 30 seconds of the shot clock, you juggle it a little bit. And, and I've seen people against us do it. I've seen us do it. We did it more last year. This year, we've been much better at it, but uh, uh, again, we do trust our defense to get stops, and that's where we've grown. You mentioned having to flush this, so when you get in the locker room, you start moving on and looking towards the last game. What was the message, and how do you get this team ready? Because the game against Pittsburgh, we'll talk about it a little bit later too, it's a huge one for you, the way you can end the season on a high note here at home. How do you get them to move past Florida State and get ready for Pitt? Well, it's real easy because it's senior day, and we have seven of them that we want to honor and seven of them that are gonna earn degrees. And I really talked to them a lot in the locker room about how proud I was of them, not only this year with how they've led us to this point, but you know the seniors and the guys that have been here, what they've given to our program th through the years, especially Leshevsky, Goodwin, and Hub, who've been here for four years. Um, I'm really proud of them. We went through it all together with that group and they took their punches and have grown up and it's really cool to see them that their families will be here and certainly you know on senior day you want to get it for them i know it means second place and momentum going to brooklyn but it's kind of a special day last home game play well in front of our fans they're going to have a lot of family here and um, can we earn one now we're playing a team that you know, we had to scratch and claw to beat. They're good on the road, and it's an ACC game, and I expect a really tough game against Pittsburgh. Coach, appreciate it. We'll step aside and come back with more on the Mike Bray Show presented by TireAct.com. It's now time for this week's edition of Irish Intel's We Go Inside the Play. Coach, this is against Georgia Tech. You guys had all kinds of success against the Yellow Jackets. Wanted to focus on this play because we don't talk a lot about Paul Atkinson in these segments with his great post work, but just tell me why this makes him such an effective low post player for you. Well, good initial feel by Cormac Ryan here. We get the ball screen. 
He rolls, we throw back, and Blake goes right into the post and watch his footwork. One-on-one mm -hmm. -on -one in the post, forget it. I mean, that, that is an absolute ballet dancer on the basketball court. And Paul is in a good rhythm, and his teammates know when we throw it to him there, it's good for us. I think there was a lot of focus on how he would adjust defensively to the ACC when he came in, but he seems like he's made a ton of strides offensively as well. What have you seen over the last three months that's allowed him to generate more offense for you on the block? Well, he's really confident. I think he's confident. He's adjust. you know, his body's in shape. Mm -hmm. He's strong because he's been in our training program and he's got people that can make shots. So look at the spacing. Yeah. Look at the spacing. You can't overhelp off of guys that can make shots and him one-on-one. -on -one, I mean, this is just beautiful. You know, you could teach a little bit of that, but a lot of that is just natural feet, man. That's, that's ballet right there. He's a dancer. <laughs> All right, Coach, this is late in the game against Georgia Tech. You have some guys on the floor that haven't seen a ton of minutes this year, but it's some great offensive execution. J.R. Kinesi is going to get the basket, but talk me through what it means as a coach to see them execute like this on the floor later. Well, you know, our, this is our blue team, and I, for them to get some game minutes in an ACC game is so important, but they're playing the right way. They're coming in, they're playing the right way, right? We get a little great back cut by J.R., and that's the stuff he can do. Great pass by Elijah Morgan. You know, just playing the right way, even at the end of the game when the spread is big. You know what else I really love? Watch the starters over there cheer on their teammates. That's fabric, man. That's what it's all about, you know? They love these guys, they respect these guys, but real good feel by Elijah, and then JR gets a feel for going without it. And man, is he gonna be a great cutter and finisher next year for us. I just want to ask, you mentioned the bench. I mean, how much of that, you know, that, that's really what this is all about, right? Because the guys that are on the floor right now are usually doing that for the guys yep. on the bench. To see them reciprocate that without hesitation, it just shows how connected this team is. That's your goal as the leader, to, to create that kind of, I've never, is that the highest Blake has gotten, you know, this year? And he's gotten up there. But that's what you're trying to create. In unison, they're all up. And, and, and cheering, and and uh, that's why it's awesome to be part of a team. Okay, Coach, this last play is a defensive stand. I thought you guys were really good a few times against Florida State, especially late in the game. This isn't the first half, though. You make them take it all the way down to late in the shot clock. Just talk me through some of the defensive principles that work well for you here. You know, here's where we've grown defensively, you know, playing connected, you know, and being able to stay in front of our own guy. Mm -hmm. Great by Cormac to cut off that drive. Position's good. We got our help side in there. Right, we get under, we get back up with Blake, right? We do a good job communicating a switch right there. We're up on a shooter possibly. Now it gets to be late in the clock. You don't want to foul, you want to wall up. Really good here. We stay down and challenge a tough shot. And this is the stuff, great rebound by Dane. When we do that consistently, we really have a chance. I wanted to ask you about one guy that stuck out to me there. You mentioned Cormac earlier, but it was really, I thought Blake had two closeouts where he didn't foul, he stayed on his feet for the most part. He, he almost contests this twice against Evans. I just think Blake has really improved yeah. as a defensive player. I know he can jump the passing lane and get out and start transition, but both on ball and off ball in the half court, I feel like he's gotten really good here in the second half of the year. And I think, I think when we talk about his game being more efficient offensively, it's been more efficient here. You know, he's learned to not gamble. Mm -hmm to be in good position, to use his length, to help. And again, I think he's got older teammates that really help him and talk to him. This this is just great D. Yeah. That's a tough shot. We talk about, we want teams to take tough twos. Mm -hmm. Tough twos, chase them off the arc, that's a tough two. Now we just, when we get that first miss like Dane does, and we've done that most of the time, yeah. but when we've been bitten, we can't get that first miss. Enough. <laughs> that does it for this week's edition of Irish Intel. When we come back, we'll have Irishography on the Mike Bray Show presented by TireRack.com. So, Coach, you guys are now 30 games into the season. I just want to ask, what's been the most rewarding part about coaching this team this year and seeing their development? Um, Tony, I smile when you say that. The season's not over yet. However, um, it's been one of my more gratifying experiences over the last probably 10 years in the profession. Um, it started back in June, and uh, we challenged the young people to uh, take on another standard in terms of um, being more complete as a team on both sides of the ball. And I think they've uh, accepted it with open arms, and I think it shows with the love of success we've had up until this point. Are we where we want to be? 
each and every day, no. But um, we've had some great consistent success throughout this season, which is something that really has excited us and really felt like we're making strides with where we want to be and how we want to play the game on both sides of the floor. I want to ask about some of that work then in the summer because I know a huge point of emphasis for you and the rest of the coaching staff was the defensive side of the floor. And I feel like this team is a totally different defensive team this year, thanks in large part to that work. So what does it take to get a team to buy in and then ultimately put that plan into action on the floor defensively the way this team has this year? Well, Coach and I, we've kind of summed it up as we've prioritized and we've emphasized mm -hmm. and we've re-emphasized. But, um, you know, in choosing to come back and join coach here at this wonderful university, um, I thought it really fit what myself's about, but I've always felt that I'm a great fit for the University of Notre Dame. Balance and consistency are two of my favorite words. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the reputation is always about coach being this offensive guy. Well, I've always tried to balance him and be this defensive guy. But no, I, I love the game offensively. Uh, I've studied it a lot, um, you know, working before coming back uh, with Coach Grant at Dayton, who had been previously two years uh, in the NBA. Uh, it was almost like a full completion of some of my thoughts in terms of coaching the game of basketball. But um, coach talks offense, I talk defense. He'll get happy with offense, then I say something about defense. <laughs> but we've been able to complement each other that way. But then at the end of the day, the ability to, you know, offense, we say share the game, or share the ball, where I'm saying let's share the game and share the game defensively as well in terms of being committed to being a good on-ball defender, but also being committed to being a good help side defender with your teammate. Mm -hmm. And the consistency piece comes in with, can you do it consistently? Day in and day out, you gotta rep it, you gotta emphasize it, and then you gotta re-emphasize it because the season continues on whether you like it or not. And part of that, you know, in this highly competitive sport in one of the most tradition-rich programs, uh, and conferences in the country, we've had some great streaks this year. Since December 20th, um, we've had winning streaks of six, five, and four. But for that to happen, there's gotta be a balance. You don't just do it on one side of the ball. We need to score the ball. We love to excitedly score the ball, share the game, but we had to share the game defensively. And even as most recently as last night, um, at Florida State on the road, we had two shot clock violations. Yeah. But then through all of that, we say three consecutive stops is what we can call as one kill. Mm -hmm. However, you got to complete the possession. And there's a couple of rebounds that we would have loved to mm -hmm. have been able to squeeze and get possession so that we can go back and score. Because the mentality of stop scores, mm -hmm. it's a lot easier to score when the team, had, your opponent has missed mm -hmm. versus you getting it out of the net. And that's when we do that, get stops. The ability for us to really play freely and share the game offensively, it's a beautiful thing to watch. But again, to impact winning individually and collectively, you got to do it on that defensive side of the floor as well. Let me follow up on one thing you, or you mentioned there, and that's about Notre Dame. And, and you think you're a great fit here. It's your third time here, so of course, I know you love the place if you come back three times. What about this place excites you? What about this place is special to you? Why do you find yourself at Notre Dame again? The First, you know, Coach Bray and I, we've grown a great relationship over the years. There's been much respect for he and I in terms of how each of us have gone about our careers mm -hmm. in college coaching and the level of success while we're both striving to leave our legacies throughout the profession. Um, it's bigger than I, it's bigger than him. He's never made it about himself. I try to say the same thing, but we enjoy the young people that we're able to attract at Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. And Notre Dame is not about the present. A lot of it is about beyond your years at Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a great um, 
environment for young people to grow in. And you know, you mentioned earlier about how has it been. Um, I know I'm a repetitive junkie when it comes to coaching. Um, I call myself, I'm a reminder coach. I just remind you every day. Yeah. And um, I think it was Cole Mac Ryan one day said, Coach, you're always excited, you're, like, you're always up. And I said, that's, that's a life thing though. When you young people leave this experience of college life, it's gonna be important for you to do the same thing in whatever uh, choice you make in terms of life after college. But it's, uh, it's, it's a place that Trace and I, our kids, our youngsters, our kids actually grew up around here. Two daughters graduated from um, the local mm -hmm. uh, public high school here, uh, Penn High School. Mm -hmm. But then on our first stint, our youngest, AJ, was born at the St. Joe Hospital, which was downtown at that time. So the ties uh, back to the University of Notre Dame have been great, it's been meaningful, but the, the total package, the balance of the university, it's not just this, it's not just that, mm -hmm. it's all of this. Mm -hmm. And for a youngster to come here uh, at the age that you start college, what a way to set, um, to challenge yourself and set some standards mm -hmm. to reach your goals in terms of beyond your college years. I wanna ask you about the role of an assistant or an associate head coach on a staff, because I think when people look at programs, they always focus on the head coach, but I know you talk to players, the relationships with all the coaches are, are very different depending uh, on the individual. So for you, what's your focus when you're not the head coach or the associate head? What are you really focused on on a day-to-day -day with this team to ensure that you give them everything they need to improve as a team and as an individual? Well, I think the, the role you're talking about, and probably over the last, 10, 15 years now. It's been what, 14 years since I was a head coach, mm -hmm. those four years at uh, St. Bonaventure University. You know, when you've been in that seat, uh, you really learn how to assist. Now, mm -hmm. I've touched on five decades in this profession. Started back in the 80s. Um, I think this is my 34th season. But out of the 34 seasons, I've only been a head coach for four. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at three decades of assisting and serving someone else right. in the program, but I don't take it lightly. Um, the head coach can't do it all. And as I mentioned, you know, for the last 15 years, it has really set home with me in terms of the importance of a staff. It, it, it really starts there mm -hmm. because back to the reminder piece, you know, you go in the office, you have agreements, you have disagreements, but the ability to walk out of that door as a staff and to go present what the game plan is, how to accomplish the different missions that take place within a program, within a game, within a season, I think I really consider a great team player that way. And um, the ability to assist that way, um, and I think I've continued to do it with great energy. Um, I value the, the words of leaders of men. Um, I had great high school coaches, had great college coaches, and I think about them a lot of how they helped shape me to get to where I am today in this profession. They keep up with me, but um, you have to be an assistant that really values the ability to serve others, to compliment, Sometimes good cop, bad cop, as people say. But the one thing I, I tell young people all the time, when, if, if you view this, if you see a coach as the bad cop, I promise you 10 to 15 years later, you're gonna find out that when you thought he was the bad cop, he was more than likely the good cop. Mm -hmm. But you, sometimes you're too young at that moment to really understand it. But um, the ability to do it here, Tony has been, um, you know, this is my third stint, as you said but I've, I've loved every day of it. And then there's a personal competitiveness about me when it comes to working uh, at Notre Dame, and I'll share it with you. Um, you know, people say football school, and I do, I love college football, I love the environment, I love it here. I can't wait for the team to run out of the tunnel still to this day. But just because they say it's a football school is no reason why we can't be exceptional and excellent 
between the lines in terms of basketball and the other sport. I think it all comes together that way. There's a spirit about it that I think is exceptional. And um, I, I still, you know, the ability to win on the road the way we have this year has been really gratifying. And I smile inward a lot. I don't celebrate. Uh, as my wife said, you don't, you don't smile. I said, my smile will come on Selection Sunday. That's mm -hmm. been the focus since June. How do we get the name call back mm -hmm. on the screen on Sunday, uh, March in 2022? Um, we put ourselves in position. But again, that Sunday's not here yet, so I don't have much to smile about yet. <laughs> but um, it, it's been great. You led me to my last question, <clears throat> which is just about the month of March. And I want to know, you know, obviously it's been a great year, but what's going to be the key for this team in the postseason, whether it's ACC tournament, NCAA tournament, and beyond? As a coach, when you look at this team, what do you guys have to do to make this the successful postseason that you guys want it to be? We're going back to the beginning. We're going back to where it all started. You have to defend the basketball, and we're going to continue to emphasize it and prioritize it. And we're not, we're not going to allow it to get old. We're going to continue to say it. But again, they're going to have to do it as they've done it all year, uh, completing possessions mm -hmm. in terms of getting the opponent's first miss. It, it, it just means so much. One, you get to go to offense after making the miss and you're not getting it out of the net. And we're a good team when we got a certain pace mm -hmm. and our spacing is right early in possession. We're a difficult te team to defend. We got multiple threats inside, starting with Paul, but then we can space the floor with four other guys that have a feel and an understanding of how to play the game the right way. We share that ball and it's beautiful. But we more emph more emphasizing that we got to share the game. Mm -hmm. Sharing the complete game is playing together effectively on defense and offense because that's the piece that allows you to be in position to play in March, have success in March, and um, there's nothing like it. Uh, to hear your name called um, is probably a big reason why I do what I do every day. Mm -hmm. uh, it's always in my mind to play in March. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my last time here uh, was in 16, and that was the end of back-to-back -back Elite Eight experiences. Uh, I've ripped some suit pants on the bench, and no one ever knew that, but it was all worth it. The, the experience of March is what it's about, and I love it for the young people we work with, even the managers. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's a beautiful thing that for everyone to share in, and um, why not Notre Dame basketball being led by Coach Mike Bray? Coach, appreciate it, and good luck in the postseason. Thank you, Tony. That does it for this week's Irishography. When we come back, we'll look ahead on The Mike Bray Show, presented by TireAct.com. This week's show, Coach, one final regular season game. It's against Pittsburgh. We talked about it a little bit earlier, how it's going to be a great senior day. A tough Pittsburgh team coming in that really pushed you earlier in the season. But when you think about this senior class, what comes to mind as you send them off of their final home game? how they've grown together and were punched early in their careers and learned to get tougher and better and learned that they needed each other. And to see seven of them earning degrees from this great university in a couple months, I'm extremely, I'm a proud father when I think about those seven. Let's look ahead a little bit further. You, of course, have locked up the double bye, as we talked about. Not quite sure yet where you'll be seated, but as you said, you're going to play in the evening half of the bracket, so you know at least a little bit where you'll be situated. You have a chance to win three in a row to win an ACC championship. You did it back in 2015. When you get set for the postseason like this, what's the mindset going to be for this team going into Brooklyn? Well, first of all, I like going to New York. It reminds me of the old Big East days. I love going to the city. We are 9-3 and three in Barclays and we're 11 and six overall in the ACC mm. tournament. I like the karma as we head up there. And the last time the tournament was there, we were in position to win a second one and Bonzi Colson sprained his ankle and Duke got us. So maybe there's some unfinished business in that building we'd like to revisit. Coach, thanks, looking forward to the postseason. That does it for this week's Mike Bray Show presented by TireAct.com.